the, uh, as I think it becomes clear to you how important this institution is in the history of the faith and also in the history of religions. We've never had such a widespread representation of, of, of different continents, the nations, ethnic backgrounds, serving in an immediate capacity to the center of one of the, of the faith. And of course the guardian was the very center, sign of God, of God on earth. And he individually selected living hands from 19, uh, uh, 1951 on, uh, which uh, reached the number of 27 before his passing in 1957. Uh, it was in the middle of the World Crusade that I became a Baha'i and very early on had the opportunity to meet some of the hands of the cause. The first one that I saw, uh, as I recall, is Millie Collins. Dear Millie Collins was serving in the World Center, but it, during the summer months, because of the intense heat there, she would come to the West and rest a bit in, in uh, Arizona, and then oftentimes travel on to visit friends, the Baha'i friends in California. One morning, without, without realizing it, I was at a youth class studying the faith in the Los Angeles Baha'i Center, and they said that a hand of the cause is meeting with the local assembly upstairs, and she'll be coming down shortly. And so when she came down, we all lined up to, to be able to just see her. She was very gracious, but was also moving rather rapidly. But I remember the impression of seeing such a radiant face. The woman was all light. She just shone. And I heard later on that she was going to meet with the youth in Phoenix uh, in two days' time. And I arranged a carload of youth, and we all drove from California to Arizona, which was not too short a trip, to be present in the, in the meeting of the youth there in Phoenix with her. Now that was well worth the, the uh, difficulties involved. And she came into this meeting and she immediately began speaking about Shoghi Effendi, how dear Shoghi Effendi was and how kind he was to her and how she was so honored to be living in the master's house Shoghi Fendi had invited her when he appointed her a hand of the cause and brought her to the Holy Land, invited her to live in one of the rooms of the house of Abdul Baha. When she spoke about the guardian, she started shining like a light. I, the, the lady had very thick glasses anyway, Millie Collins, and between the big luminous eyes that she had, when she turned the full light on, they were like searchlights. I uh, had never seen anything like that in my life and uh, was very attracted to it and she told some beautiful stories about, about the guardian and his humility and his kindness and they would have meals with Shoghi Effendi in the evening with the pilgrims, the other hands of the cause, together with the pilgrims who were present in the Holy Land. And uh, she, uh, she was a, a woman who came from a wealthy background and she was able to contribute money to the, to the cause of God that the guardian used to purchase the temple site on Mount Carmel and also to buy different ornamentations, one of which uh, was a, a large gate that Shoghi Effendi acquired here in the United Kingdom and had shipped to the Holy Land. And uh, this eventually became the, Col the Collins Gate. He named it after Millie Collins. And it's the gate that stands at the point of approach to the Most Holy Shrine of Baha'u'llah in Akka. Uh, I had the uh, bounty of uh, being appointed in 19, let's see, it was 1963 to the Auxiliary Board. And the Auxiliary Board at that time consisted of nine members attending to propagation and nine attending to protection. And uh, I was quite young, but I had been serving in, with my wife in an Indian area in Nicaragua. And the Hands of the Cause in the Holy Land had uh, been informed about that, and they asked us if we'd be willing to relocate to Bolivia. 
Bolivia had had the first of the mass teaching in, in the heart of South America. There were about 10,000 Baha'is at the time. And uh, dear Masu Kamsi, who was the board member there at that time, uh, needed to return to the uh, Cradle of the Faith to Iran because of various business responsibilities. He'd been out there quite a while and had incurred debts. And, so he had to go back for he came later he came back later and incorporated into the activities once more. But at that time we arrived ourselves, Marilyn, my, Marilyn, my wife Marilyn and I, moved down through this uh, traveling, visiting Baha'is through the Central and South America until we got to Bolivia. And shortly thereafter, uh, at that uh, in those first stages, uh, my activities were directed by the hand of the cause, Zekr Lechadim. We've, his picture was here, although we didn't hear the names of the various hands. Uh, he was from the Cradle of the Faith, but he'd been serving in North America for some time. And he was the second hand of the cause that I met. He, he was sent by the Guardian in 1957 to the Baha'i Summer Schools in the United States to speak about the Covenant and the uh, significance of of loyalty to the covenant and also about covenant breaking. And uh, the, he had a, a terrific e effect. I, it was Geyserville that time, on the, it was the Baha'i school on the Pacific coast. And uh, we were Baha'i youth that were there. I remember uh, the, the marvelous talk he gave about the covenant. And afterwards he sat under the, what was the great tree at Geyserville, it had picnic tables under it. And he sat with the youth, and from the, his own experience, he began counseling us, offering ideas to us. I, what we were particularly struck about, he said that you should memorize the teachings of the faith, memorize the writings of the faith. So some of us were brave and asked him, what, what, what did he suggest we memorize? And, uh, to our astonishment, he said, the Kitabi Gan, the Book of Certitude, would be a good place to start. And then he suggested the Tablets to the Kings. He saw our apprehensions growing, I think. Finally, he came uh, to the point where he said, you know, you could start with the Tablet of Carmel. Well, the Tablet of Carmel, some of us knew, was six or seven pages long, and that already seemed like a, a very <laughs> onerous task. And he told us that the friends, the youth in Iran, had, many of them had memorized the Kitab Akdas, the Kitab Gan, the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, the Tablets of the Kings, all of it seemed totally beyond our comprehension, not having had the custom of memorizing lengthy passages of any sort in schooling in the West. Uh, dear Mr. Khadem came to Los Angeles. He visited there for a, uh, a brief period, carrying out some uh, activities that uh, Shoghi Effendi had assigned to him. And I had the bounty, I had a car and I had free time. I was an actor at that time in films and had access to some of the studios. And I drove him around to his different appointments and then had the opportunity to take him to a film set where a cowboy movie was being filmed. And I tried to situate him in a position where he could see a bit of what was going on without being directly involved. There was a mine shaft being filmed. The camera was at this end, the mine shaft was there, and the uh, heroes and heroines were running out of the mine shaft, but the, uh, their enemies were shooting at, supposed to be shooting at them from what I thought was behind. Uh, we were at a side passage of the, of the mine shaft, out in the open, open air, but under some lights and things. And I remember the... Uh, the thing started and when it, the moment came, the moment of truth for me, the cowboys ran to that place, lifted up their guns and shot directly at Mr. Khadim and myself. <laughs> <laughs> of course they were blanks, but the impression was quite, uh, I, I thought I had uh, uh, un, unintentionally offered in martyrdom one of the hands of the cause. Mr. Khadim was very gracious about it. We tripped over some of the lights and they suggested we move out of that area. <laughs> he, he met with the Baha'i youth, very encouraging to the Baha'i youth in 
in the Los Angeles area, and he went, went on to the other schools. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Dr. G. Carey, with his wife and with the widow of the Hand of the Cause, uh, Ali, uh, Mohammed Varga, let's see, Varga the father, that is Baliola Varga, that's right, Baliola Varga. And uh, that was a lovely visit too. And he, of course, had been very closely associated with Shoghi Effendi at the World Center of the Faith and was a, uh, one of the hands of the cause in the Holy Land and associated with what was Shoghi Effendi had appointed as the International Baha'i Council, a member at large of that body. So he had, he had wonderful stories and he also spoke about, about the beloved guardian and his qualities. And you know, when the hands met and discussed about the future of the institution of the hands and whether they should, there should be some way to appoint hands or not. And they, so they said, well, what are the essential qualities of the hands? And they looked at, they all examined the whole body of hands that was there and they couldn't find any, everyone was different, entirely different, quite unique. That the one thing that, quality that they had was devotion to the guardian and uh, instant support and obedience to whatever he asked of them. And that was what they, they saw as the only common characteristic that they could find. There were among them, there was an illiterate, there were pe tribal background people, there were doctors, there were scholars, there were housewives, there were all kinds, just all level of, of individuals, but who had been engaged in the teaching of the faith, and Shoghi Effendi had said had been named for various reasons, some for their character, for their saintliness, some for their, their writings and defense of the cause, some of them for their uh, lengthy travel serving the cause. Very interesting analysis that they made, but in the end they said it was this devotion. Uh, at, after that, uh, I had a chance to meet Mr. Khadam again in the United States. I met Horace Holly at the, one of the Baha'i conventions, one of the last, the convention that was held just after the passing of the Guardian. The previous year I'd been to the National Convention for the first time and then again in 1958. And we had this marvelous conference, one of the conferences called by Shoghi Effendi at the midpoint of the crusade to celebrate the victories of the first five of the ten years of the crusade. And the representative of the beloved guardian at that conference, named by Shoghi Effendi before his passing, was Mr. Uh, Dr. Ugo Giacchari. Uh, the, you can only imagine the poignancy of the moment when the chairman of the National Assembly announced that the representative of the beloved guardian uh, had just entered the hall and we all stood and we all wept, I'm afraid. We're just thinking of, he himself was cheerful that representing the guardian and the guardian had passed away. And the messages that they would have, he would have given them to present to the conferences had been withheld, if you, so to speak, because he passed on his way. But they had the map of the mid, the achievements of the mid, point of the crusade and another map of supplementary achievements that the guardian had made just in those brief days that he was here in, in London before his passing. And they showed those and talked about that, those victories. It was a marvelous uh, event. The, uh, Mr. Holly was also present for, on that occasion. Then, uh, after that, uh, I had uh, offered to pioneer. I was a youth, but first they told me, you better get a bit older before you go. But in the end, I, just when I was 21, I was able to go to Nicaragua. And I went to this remote corner of Nicaragua, and I thought, I'll never see any of the hands of the cause again in my life. And as it was, they came one by one and visited. Bluefields, Nicaragua. 
they, they really move heaven and earth traveling around during those, those five years. Dr. G. Carey himself came and stayed several days with me. Ina Kolinga came. Uh, Dr. Featherstone, Mr. Featherstone, call us Featherstone. Uh, Dr. Mahajir, all spent time in the, uh, what was called the Mosquito Coast. For good reason it was called the Mosquito <laughs> Coast. And they, uh, they thrilled crowds of people that, of course, the way we, the, myself and then other pioneers that arrived on the scene were not able to do. Uh, Dr. G. Carey, I remember the, about 80 people came out to a meeting that I held that we arranged for him to speak. And he spoke about the Guardian to, the, to them, brand new friends of the faith or people who knew the Baha'is. And Ina Kolinga also had a large meeting there in Bluefields and uh, thrilled the uh, people with his explanations. Uh, that was the, I had met Mr. Oling a couple weeks before at the formation of the Nation, First National Spiritual Assembly of Panama, which was a, a, a very interesting event. He was the representative of the World Center of the Faith at that inaugural convention. And after that, we were able to, uh, I was able to travel with him a bit inside of, of Panama. We took him to the Panama Canal. And uh, he told stories about Shoghi Effendi while he was looking at the the ships passing through the canal, and they were they were thri thrilling stories. Uh, I didn't know that he would be able to come to where I was residing, but a couple of weeks later he arrived on the scene in Bluefields, and I took him by canoe and small motor boats to a place called Pearl Lagoon, which sounds very romantic, as long as you forget that it's on the Mosquito Coast. <coughs> And uh, he dedicated a Baha'i Center in a, in a village where we had uh, been teaching the cause and a number of people had become Baha'is and they had volunteered to make a kind of a large basket which became the Baha'i Center of Raitipura, as it was called then. And he was so inspiring to all of us and said that he had originally wanted to pioneer to the, uh, to the uh, Central American coast uh, when the crusade had begun. But um, the Guardian had sent encouragement to the local assembly of Kampala in Uganda that it's, he hoped that its members would arise. And indeed he did arise and he went as a pioneer with several other Africans to the west coast of Africa from Uganda which was defined by Shoghi Fendi as the heart of Africa. And Mr. Olinga settled in, Cam in the Cameroon. He opened the Cameroon. He became the Knight of Baha'u'llah for the Cameroon. And uh, his teaching efforts there, which I heard about later from him personally, when he traveled in Latin America, were extraordinary to the degree that Shoghi Effendi gave him a title, Abu Futul, the father of victories. Within a short time, he had a hundred believers. Uh, this is, in, in those stages, there was no mass teaching yet in the world, and it was an extraordinary confirmation that he had while he was there. Uh, some of his colleagues, some of the very first Baha'is, obviously these were very new Baha'is, they'd been Baha'is a couple of years. They opened other neighboring countries and became the Knights of Baha'u'llah for those neighboring lands of Western Africa. Uh, we were in South America for a time. I, as I say, I was, uh, my activities as a board member were directed by Mr. Kadem and then Mr. Kaze, the hand of the cause, uh, who had been in the Holy Land serving for a time between the passing of the Guardian and the election of the House of Justice. He settled in South America. He was there for five years and we had a, a wonderful close association with with this gentleman who had, was one of the last of the hands named, and he had been traveling at the instructions of Shoghi Effendi to all the Baha'i localities of Iran. He's several years 
going from village to village where there were Baha'is and encouraging them. Uh, Mr. Kazi was a very interesting man. He was a military man and uh, he uh, had uh, been uh, uh, trained as, as uh, a veterinarian. And he, so he, had a, he was assigned in the military as a governor of several tribal areas. He had, had the rank of colonel in the army. And he himself told a story. He said that the, the Guardian had suspended pilgrimage from 1941 to 1951 because of the, on the one hand, the violation of his family members uh, in leaving the cause, and uh, on the other, the very precarious state of... Uh, of the of the Holy Land of Palestine and the and the future coming into being of Israel, after that those that was over, things had calmed down a bit by by 1951, and the Guardian again invited the first pilgrims. The first pilgrims to come from the east at that time were Mr. Kaze and Mr. Kaden, both of whom I've had had association with there in the past. And uh, they were the two pilgrims. One of the thrilling <coughs> events uh, of that time, since it had been so long, one of the relatives of the, of the Bob, a descendant of the uncle of the Bob, who had received the original Book of Certitude, the kitab i had given the manuscript to the National Assembly of Iran <coughs> to be delivered to Shoghi Effendi as a gift from the family. Well, this was a, one of the most precious relics we have in the faith. And Shoghi Effendi said that it was too precious to send by, hand, by mail, and the time should wait when they could deliver it. So when he invited Mr. Khadim to come to the Holy Land, he asked that he bring the copy of the manuscript with him, this original he gone in the handwriting of Abdul Baha with corrections and annotations, additions by Baha'u'llah himself. And he had brought that there and it was, it was thr thrilling to the guardian. He took it to the pilgrim house table that uh, first night after Mr. Khadim had arrived. And uh, the, uh, showed, he showed it to the friends present one of whom was Dr. J. Carey, and he's written something of the history of that moment and how thrilled the Guardian was to unwrap this package and show, show them this original work of Baha'u'llah. Mr. Khazi said that he very much wanted to go on pilgrimage, but that, that there was a, presented a challenge to him because he had heard uh, that the uh, Beloved guardian could read your mind, and he said, you know, I wasn't sure what I might think while I was there, <laughs> and it made me a little apprehensive. So he went to Mr. Furitan and spoke with Mr. Furitan about this, but at that time Mr. Furitan was a hand of the cause himself, one of the first hands of the cause, and he said that he should trust in God, he should make the pilgrimage, he'd been invited, not to worry, the guardian had great insight, but... Uh, he wouldn't be embarrassed or nothing would happen. He, he did, thought that things would be okay and Mr. Kaze said, well, he thought he'd take the chance. He wanted very much to go on pilgrim. So he came and he said, we, uh, the guardian had put Mr. Kadem and myself in the Eastern Pilgrim House, which is very close to the, to the shrine of the Bob, just a walk from there. And in the afternoon, the guardian's custom with the Eastern Pilgrims was to drive uh, up to the Pilgrim House and meet the pilgrims and then walk with them to visit the shrines. And that was a very blessed uh, uh, experience for the, the Persian men. The Persian women in the meanwhile were down in the master's house meeting with Rahil Khanum and after Shoghi Vindi finished visiting with the, with the Persian men, he would return to his home and he would have a time with the Persian women as well. Mr. Kazi said that everything was going all right. We were walking towards the shrine, and Shoghi Fendi was, was speaking about various things as we, were, as we were walking. 
And at one, one point he, he began praising Mr. Kadim. About two lines he said into this praise, Mr. Kadim fainted. <laughs> so now the guardians, Mr. Kadim's on the ground, the guardian's down on his knees, he's lifted up Mr. Kadim's head and is stroking his brow and trying to <laughs> revive him. And Mr. Kadim opens his eyes and sees the beloved guardian right there <laughs> and faints again. <laughs> Mr. Kazi never said it, but he was getting a little impatient, I think, that, they, <laughs> that, the, that Mr. Kadem couldn't seem to stay conscious. You know? <laughs> so they, they've got Mr. Kadem up, and he was okay, they say, and they went on to the shrine. And the guardian took them, as was his uh, custom, guided them to the shrine of the Bob. Uh, some of you who have been on pilgrimage, you would, you would visit the shrine of the Bob and of Abdu'l-Bah, in, in sequence when you were there. But in the time of the guardian, he would one day take them to the shrine of, of the Bob, and the next day would take them to the shrine of the master. So this was the first opportunity they'd had to visit the shrine of the Bob. And when they were in the shrine, this blessed sign of God went forward himself first to the threshold and chanted the tablet of visitation, which is the prayer that's said in the shrines to attain the presence, if you will, of the manifestations of God, the prophet of God. And there's such a beautiful voice calling on, on this, from the Spirit on high, the Divine Spirit. And they were standing at the back of the two sides of the shrine uh, in such a spirit of appreciation that they had the blessing and honor of being there on, at such a moment. Then Shoghi Effendi prostrated himself at the threshold and then was backing out in reverence to the shrine. He didn't turn his back on it, he backed out. And they were on either side and they looked at each other like, where do we face, you know? Where do you, we face the shrine threshold or the sign of God is passing out, we've passed by, shouldn't we be facing him? So all of this was going on and Shoghi Effendi was passing out. Mr. Kaze was a rather large, portly man. He's, he said, we, I half-halfed it, half to the guardian and half to the threshold. And, <laughs> Shoghi Effendi went out, they went forward and, and had their devotions at the threshold. And then they came out. When they came out, he said the guardian had put his shoes on and he was quietly pacing back and forth in the corridor there in front of the shrine as they were putting their shoes on. And he said that, um, Shoghi Effendi said, the station of the shrine is very great. He said, the friends don't understand the station of the shrine. He said, we knew which friends he was talking about. That's <laughs> clear enough. So we got our shoes on and he, then he began extolling the greatness of the shrine. And by the time we'd come around the front of the shrine, uh, he ended up saying, you know, Baha'u'llah has, has said that this, at this point, the resting place of the shrine of the, of the Bab, that the prophets of God, the messengers of God, the saints and heroes of past ages are all circling in adoration around this blessed shrine, around the Mr. Kazi said, you know, he was, Shoghi Fendi was ahead. He didn't intend to think anything, but he, he said, good heavens, he said, what's left for Baha'u'llah if everybody's here? <laughs> Fatal mistake, you know. <laughs> so Shoghi Fendi stopped, he was facing the other way, and he turned around, and he said, and he looked directly at me. <laughs> And he smiled. <laughs> and I knew the smile was in understanding of my dilemma. And he said, and then he said the Bob and all those that circle around him circle around Baji. <laughs> well, in the spiritual world, these things are possible, you know. <laughs> I don't know how many other embarrassing moments he had, but, 
but he said it seemed clear whether the guardian could read your mind or whether he was just inspired to say what you needed to hear. In either case, that's the, that's the way things proceeded. He, uh, he later was, as I say, was called to the Holy Land after the passing of the guardian as one of the nine hands serving there during the interregnum, during the period between the passing of the guardian and the election of the Universal Office of Justice. Uh, I had the opportunity later, uh, I was appointed a counselor in, in 68, and so was, as it happened, was asked to be uh, free to move around. As it was, it was, a, it was a, a, a blessing to have the time to be able to visit the friends in five countries that was, you know, you have a board member for different parts of the country now, but in those days, uh, we had an assignment of five countries. In all five countries, there was covenant breaking. It was a very, it was a very difficult, challenging time. The chairman of the National Assembly of Bolivia broke the covenant during that period. You don't read about this in Baha'i news, but these are things that are in the history of the faith. Eventually, will be set set forth in in history. And uh, the hand of the gods was directing me to go here and go there and do this and talk to him and talk to this one and so on. All of it rather new for me. He had had experience with covenant breakers in Iran, so I had some idea about that. And then the, uh, the time passed, some passed, the situation became much better, and uh, Mr. Kazi himself returned to the uh, Cradle of the Faith to Iran, and our board was receiving various visits by different hands of the cause, uh, the two most outstanding, in my experience, that, that were immediate, in my immediate experience, were the visits of Inako Linga and then Amato Baharu Hyakhanum. Amato Baharu Hyakhanum came after the dedication of the Panama Temple, 1972, I think it was, and she, was, she spent some time in uh, Argentina, uh, especially for the first she had the first opportunity she had to visit the resting place of her mother, May Maxwell, who had, at, in her 70s, arisen, although ill, but at the, the call of the beloved guardian for pioneers to go out to these countries and visit the, the friends there. She came as a traveling teacher, the same route that Martha, that Martha Root had taken earlier on, down the eastern coast of South America. And uh, she had met Leonora Halsapel in, in Rio at that time, and then came on to Buenos Aires. And the very night that she arrived, she had a heart attack in the hotel, and so she never met the friends in Argentina. But she passed away there, and the guardian instructed the friends about her burial and so on. So it's quite moving to see Ria Conum there, and she spoke and reminisced about her mother. Maria Khanum has, has a very tender heart. She, she was known sometimes for being you know, very proper because being the guardian's uh, widow and having been the guardian's consort, she was, uh, I think, trained by him and guided by him and her own instincts were of that nature. She gave a very moving talk there at the graveside about her relationship with her mother. She said her mother was her physical mother and also her spiritual mother. And she said, uh, my plan is that after I die, I'll spend the first thousand years catching up with talking to mama, talking to my mother. Her father uh, was Sutherland Maxwell, who was a, the architect, as you know, of the Shrine of the Bob. And uh, Shoghi Fendi called on him to design a monument for May Maxwell, and so there's this beautiful monument with marble wings on the top of it. It's a lovely thing. And Maria Conum had uh, been involved in that to some degree as well. She was thrilled and she inspired the Argentine Baha'i community. And after she asked me if I would take her to the north to the 
to the remote Indian areas of Argentina. And she, she deliberately said, I want to go somewhere where no other Baha'i has ever been. Well, Baha'is had been a lot of places. <laughs> and we ended up going to a very remote spot through some back trails with uh, an old pickup truck that died on the way. <laughs> Rio Conan was very fond of animals. She collected a number of wild animals along this trip. <laughs> I must say that I was supposed to be the animal keeper and some of them would get away and she would be desperate and I would have to chase through the <laughs> underbrush and jump on agoutis, if you know what an agouti is. That was, he's kind of a beautiful glorified rat. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very affectionate with Ruth Maria Cano. <laughs> and it had a little rhinestone necklace. <laughs> Uh, there were also some kabure, some little um, chicken hawks that were there. That uh, my, uh, when we got back, my wife was was busy taking care of. We needed to buy live mice to drop in the cage. <laughs> they eventually went on to the other world as well, or whatever. <laughs> anyway, there's a, a picture of us there standing with her cousin and with some of the other travel teachers. We're standing in mud up to our ankles, but it looks like we've gone and stood in the middle of a puddle. You can't tell that there were 20 kilometers in all directions of, of flooded jungle, but that was what, what, what had happened. And uh, the, the car that we were in, eventually the whole back end of it dropped about uh, six feet into an ant hole that was under the road, and when it got wet, it just, the weight of the car sunk in there. There's no way to lift it out of there. It had to be taken out much, much later. So someone had to go and find another vehicle down the way. The way was, I don't know, I think one of the young Persians and myself walked three and a half, four hours to, to, to get to a place where we were able to find a tractor with a, coupling to take all of us out of the Chaco of the Argentina. In that place, we visited a, a village, a tribal area of the Mataco Indians, and they all embraced the cause while she was there, and she gave a feast, having uh, goats slaughtered, and we had a marvelous uh, feast there together with her. She and her cousin had I'd been sleeping in a, a small, I'm afraid I have to tell you, it was a pigsty. <laughs> but there were no pigs in it at the, at the moment. It had been cleared out and it had a mud roof. And the rest of us were sleeping out, outdoors. And, and then the rain came, terrible rain came. She, she was inside uh, a mosquito net, a Persian mosquito net. That means it has all six sides sewn together and there's a, a hole with a, a pipe that you crawl through the cloth pipe and then you tie it up <laughs> after you get into it. So she and her cousin were safely in there and we were sleeping then around, around her place where she was sleeping out of the rain. The travel teachers and the chauffeur of the, of the old pickup. It was quite a, uh, quite a night. Uh, in the morning, it, she got up and, and, and fed us pieces of watermelon that we had along and some crackers and a couple cans of sardines. I remember she said, you know, it's, it's been a terrible night and we're all dirty. Is there any place where we can bathe? And uh, the people said, yes, if you go down this little trail through the, through the woods, the thorn, thorny forest, really, it was. We came out into this beautiful lagoon. And on it, there must have been 150 flamingos. This is a kind of, like a romantic movie, except like the Mosquito Coast, <laughs> it had its own special varieties of. We had about five flat tires going from the village <laughs> till the lake because of these thorns that were in the road. Uh, 
fellows we were with were pretty able at patching the thing together and we got there. And it was a big, it was a big lagoon. And she said, well, she said, my cousin and I are going to bathe out here and you fellows should go around the other side of the lake <laughs> to, to take your baths. And uh, she said, but first, before we disturb the water, we should go and load wa the water containers that we have. So we'll have some fresh water. They'll be clean because once we walk in it, we'll probably stir up the bottom. As it turned out, the whole lake had about that much water and about that much mud under it. <laughs> I remember seeing Rivia Kano. She, she stayed fully dressed to go take her bath. And the mud was just everywhere. It was just incredible. <laughs> I, I tell you this because I want you to know what she went through to serve the cause. Uh, her cousin, her dear cousin Jan Shoot, uh, when we got to the nearest airport said, you'll forgive me, Kano, but I'm going to go home. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't go on with it. And at that point, uh, Rio Kano called Violet Nakchavani, who had been, so to speak, in reserve. And she came to Paraguay to then accompany Rio Kano and the other places on this uh, terrific trip she had. And that was not still the Green Light Expedition, which you saw a bit of here where she went through the mountains of Bolivia and up the Amazon and the, she was a real trooper. She says, I wanted the Baha'i women of the world to see that I've done this so that none of them can say, well, I can't do that, I'm a woman or I can't do that, I'm, I have a position. What position can be higher than Rehakonom's in the cause? And yet she went to all these places and went through these sacrifices and embraced these people and encouraged them. It was a beautiful thing. Uh, Mr. Olinga also came to South America. Uh, I, of course, had known him before, and the board asked me to travel with him and translate his, his talks in the different places where he was going and arrange the trip. And he, he came originally to Brazil. I met him at Foz, Foz de Iguazu, which is a big, big waterfall in the central of, center of South America. I was so excited to see him. He was totally exhausted from Brazil. Uh, the places that he'd been, and the number of meetings that they had arranged for him, they took full advantage of him. And he wanted to, to rest, so we went to Buenos Aires, where my wife and I were living. And we, we kept him incognito from the friends for a few days until he got his strength up and so on. Then he had a, a, a lovely meeting with the, the community. And he told the story of uh, his pilgrimage. And in the course of telling the story of the pilgrimage, he, he had, uh, the guardian had talked to him about, about Nasruddin Shah. Now the audience was made up of the Baha'is of, of the capital city of Buenos Aires. Most of them were of Catholic background. Some of the old ladies had been very serious Catholics, but they were Baha'is now and they were travel teachers and so on. Uh, Mr. Olinga announced that Shoghi Fendi had said that when Nasruddin Shah died, he went straight to hell. <laughs> well, there was a lady in the back of the room began fanning herself very desperately. Uh, <laughs> And then I, I, he turned to me and he said, and then Shoghi Fendi said, and he's still there. <laughs> and I translated that, the lady fainted off her chair. <laughs> it's completely in shock. You know, we Baha'is, we always talk about hell. It's, it's not a physical place, it's, a, it's another place. I don't know what we think the other place is, but there's certainly enough references in the writings that one has to bear in mind that there may be a place where people are punished for a time. We generally, uh, the, the teachings imply that God uh, punishes for the purpose of reform, for change. So we hope that Nasruddin is doing fine. I remember, <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, Ria Khanum uh, remark, she, she, she said that after she, when she'd come to the Holy Land, one day Shoghi Fendi said to her, he said, you know, when Muhammad Ali died, that is the Arch Covenant Breaker of Baha'u'llah's Covenant. He went to hell, 
And after that, we had trouble with Nasruddin because he was saying, where am I to go? Well, you can't expect me to. <laughs> anyway, he also said some other wonderful things about the, uh, the future of mankind, the greatness of the faith, the difficulties that, uh, that the cause would uh, encounter in the future, but that how ultimately the distant future was very bright. We traveled from there together, Mr. Linga uh, visited an, a number of cities in Argentina, he visited to Cordoba, and then also he, was, he also went to Mendoza, which was on the border with Chile. We flew over the Andes Mountains, and he went south from there to um, the, the Mapuche area, which had had some mass conversion in the central south of Chile. And uh, his arrival in, the, in a small town there caused a, a terrific excitement. They, they got the local movie theater. It was, about, had about, it was like this size, but it also had a balcony about the same size, about 400 people. Jam full of people screaming at the top of their lungs. This was a place that had not generally seen anybody of black origin. And uh, little beknownst to us, we'd been, I'd been pioneering in that area in, in previous years and knew a lot of the friends there and so on. The population uh, believed that if you pinched a black man, you would have good luck. <laughs> Mr. Olinger gave a talk, he greeted them uh, in Swahili, jumbo, jumbo, and they screamed and uh, we tried to give a Baha'i talk, but it was really not very con con conducive to giving a Baha'i talk. And they all wanted to come close and greet him and pinch him. <laughs> Hooper, get me out of here! <laughs> why why <are> these people? <laughs> it was terrible. So we got him out of there. And we were safe until we got to Bolivia and one of the back, the, cap, the old capital of Bolivia, Sucre, they had the same belief. <laughs> but they were a little less, they didn't come on the attack. Just, if they got close to him, they'd kind of, you know, cozy up to him and... <laughs> what is this custom, he says. <laughs> one of the... One of the, in one of the, the remote villages, uh, tribal areas in Bolivia, uh, they had uh, arranged a conference, a regional conference, and invited the friends to come from different places. This, uh, this village was kind of on a rocky hillside, and it had the typical stone, circular stone uh, dwellings with uh, mat roofs and mud roofs, so on. And we went there, we, had to, we went first by car and then we went by truck and went up hours out of the city that we'd left until we arrived at a place where we had to proceed on foot up a dry riverbed. And when we got close to the village, we saw there must have been 200 meters of children with green uh, branches of, there was nothing green around, I don't know where they got these things from, but they had created an arch of greenness for him to pass through on his way up to the center of the village, and they were all singing Baha'i songs, it was, it was really so, so moving. The uh, music of the area, they had a, a lady who sang it, I think there's got to be some relatedness between that and Chinese singing. So it's very high-pitched, sing-songy arrangement, but from time to time you'd hear Baha'i and Baha'u'llah in the middle of the, of, the, uh, of the singing. He was very touched by it. He gave this beautiful talk. Generally in the Indian villages, one of the things he would do is suggest, let us greet the house of justice, your house of justice. They'll all stand and we'll say Allah upon nine times for each of the members and then we'll pray 
say, offer our prayers and so on. So it was very moving. The people were immediately engaged in focusing on the Holy Land and thinking about the House of Justice. And they all, uh, every place, greet you with a lawa abha. They knew that. It was, it was, it was, I think it was very moving for him. We came out of there, we went high into the mountains, we slept in Potosi, which is the, one of the highest towns, certainly the highest airport in the world, at over 5,000 meters. And uh, was a nice little hotel. I met Mr. Olinga in the morning and asked how he was. He said that he, he was all right. He said, uh, I didn't go to bed though. I didn't not want to wake up. I sat up all night <laughs> and prayed. The, the air there was very, very thin, I can tell you that. And after that we went into another remote area and he met in a, in a Baha'i schoolhouse with the people. A beautiful meeting there. We came out of there on the top of a truck that was filled up with um, bags of vegetable goods and other things that had filled the whole truck so that you were really sitting on the top of a very precarious load, holding onto the edges, lying flat if you could, and holding onto the edges of the, of the truck and onto each other to not fall off while you came down this mountain road. And we came to Oruro, which is the central city of the Altiplano, the high plain of, of Bolivia. And here, Mr. Olinga, uh, we got off and we were introduced to the rector of the university who said that there was a public meeting arranged, the people were all in the hall, they'd been waiting for us for half an hour or something like that, and uh, that the uh, program was going to be transmitted by the national radio, his talk. And by the way, your talk is about science and religion. So <laughs> I thought, <laughs> not a lot of time to prepare for the talk. We went straight into the hall and and uh, he began to give this exquisite presentation, so dignified, so comprehensive. I uh, was taking notes and translating, and as I was taking notes, I said, I'm going to check. I think he's memorized the talk of Abdul Baha. This sounds just like Abdul Baha, <laughs> but I could never find that. But he, he told me later, he said, in the presence of the guardian, the guardian had said that he wanted him to master Abdul Baha's teaching approach in the West. You know, study it thoroughly, absorb it, and use it. And I saw that happening over and over in the three months that I traveled with Mr. Olinga, country by country. When he was speaking with the Baha'is, he had again the content and tone of the way the Master spoke to Baha'is, to the public, public talks, and to uh, dignitaries. He had other other levels of speech that he gave. He, he electrified populations. I saw one place in Ecuador, we came off of a bus halfway from the capital, Quito, down to the coast in Esmeraldas, a place called Quinende. Mr. Linga got off the bus within instant, he had children hanging from both his hands. All types of children came to him and when the other children saw children were going to him, they all came too. And he was laughing and, and uh, speaking to them in English, of course, they couldn't understand <laughs> what was going on. And then he, because he was keeping the people from coming, getting off the bus, he moved out into the center of the road and he began walking down like the king down the center of the, of the main road of the town. People piled behind us, must have been 200 people there in that group walking and he was greeting people sitting in their, their homes and on their benches and everyone was saying, who is this? This is an African king, must be an African king. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mixed population, so there were a lot of uh, people of Af African origin there as well. And they were all very excited. We had a huge meeting that night, with the number of enrollments. Uh, he he had had this very intimate experience in the Holy Land during his pilgrimage. The guardian had put him in the Eastern Pilgrim House, uh, 
who, there were no Eastern pilgrims there at the time, which meant that Shoghi Fendi came in the afternoons and took him to the shrines alone, the two of them together. And he said, he also invited me to come in the mornings to the master's house where he spoke to me and taught me. He, he said it, and it wasn't in an immodest way, and he taught me all things. And some of the subjects he would mention from time to time, make your hair stand up, I don't have any hair, but I did then, uh, about, about, the, um, about the wonders of the solar system and all, all manner of uh, information that he gave. He, he asked him about Baha'u'llah if he was the universal manifestation for the universe or for what does it mean? And Shoghi Effendi said he is the universal manifestation for this planet and its peoples uh, that are here and for those that pass on after death. So that was very, very interesting to him. And he said uh, he, he talked to me about the development of the plans everywhere and the work of the cause. Now, Mr. Lingo was not yet a hand of the cause, but he did have, have this title of Father of Victories. And it was uh, several years later that Shoghi Fendi named him in that last contingent of hands as a hand of the cause of God. Uh, the, uh, another time in Central America, Dr. Madja visited. And he was there, he gave a talk in the town where we were, and then we were telling him about these Pearl Lagoon and the different activities that were there, and he said, what's the other way? He said, well, we don't know. He said, well, then let's go that way. So we'll go to new places. And he brought in a couple of villages, showed us the mass teaching techniques that he'd been using around the world, and with such a loving embrace, he brought these villages to the faith. He and, uh, and uh, Ruth uh, Yancey Pringle, who was a counselor at, the, at that time in Central America as well, or not, not yet at that time, but became a counselor later on. She was pioneering there. And he went back with her on a small boat in the sea up the coast back to where we'd come from in Bluefields. And he said to me, he said, now there's three villages this way, one day and two days, three days travel up a river and so on. He said, Hooper, you go down there and don't come back until they're all Baha'is. <laughs> well, I think he, you know, added the, the strength of his own prayers. Fortunately, they did embrace the faith in those villages in the same way that they had in the other two. So that was a, a, a thrilling breakthrough for us because we'd been trying to teach them the will and testament and other difficulties. And he was able to tell us what the guardian had instructed in Africa and how you watch the hearts of the people. And if they're moved, if they're illiterates, they don't have any background in history and general knowledge of society, bring them in, but watch them and, and increase their love for the faith. These people became very wonderful, solid Baha'is. The, um, the later history that I have, of course, is being called, as a counselor, I went in 1973 to the World Center, to the convention, and the counselors all met there. They met with the House of Justice. They talked about the future establishment of the International Teaching Center. And I, did, I, I was going on to a pilgrimage in the cradle of the faith at, at just after the convention, which I did. And I was there, I was in Yaz at the day the appointment of the International Teaching Center took place. And they had sent the message to Tehran, but it was unsafe in any manner to either call or telegraph to Yaz. So they had to wait for several days till I came out. And I was having a wonderful visit with the friends in Yaz, although they, they also had to be careful about my being seen with them and uh, they would give me instructions how to walk in the streets and where I could go and take photographs around the town. And then they took me quietly uh, to the graves of the martyrs, the different martyrs, the seven martyrs, 13 martyrs, and also a house there uh, where there were some 13 martyrs buried in the town itself in the patio of a home. And uh, Mr. Zabihullah was the, was the auxiliary board member, uh, was accompanying me during that visit. 
And one, one morning we, we went to the house of Adib Tarzadeh's father. This is Tar Malmir. He was, the, he was a great teacher of the faith. He'd been on pilgrimage with Nabil in the time of Baha'u'llah. The stories are in, in uh, uh, Adib's books, the revelation of Baha'u'llah, Adib Tarzadeh's books. You can see there. The house had been shut up for a long time. And as, the, as he undid the lock on the door, a little boy was in the alley where we were, and he, he began shouting to us, Hune Babi, Hune Babi. That means, it's a Babi's house. You know, how can you go near there? Like it's haunted, or it was this, if you open the door, I don't know, we don't know what will come out. You know, <laughs> there was this terrible fear in this child, and he ran ran along and we slipped into the house and he took me upstairs to the room where where Adib's father used to have the firesides in the middle of the night people would come and sneak into the house and then they could hear about the Baha'i teachings uh, this marvelous histories that came out of that and that gentleman himself became a martyr just to some a couple of years after I was there the uh, he took me to one place, he said, when I was a young man, one of the Baha'i youths had been attacked in the town and had been thrown down a well, and the well was in the center of a plaza, an open area, and they'd thrown rocks, large rocks on top and, and killed him. And he said, we wanted to recover the body, but we couldn't recover the body. They waited for one of the very important Muslim holy days, and on that holy day, all the city, everybody would go to, to a mosque, a special mosque where there was this large wooden structure that they would carry on their backs in remembrance of the martyrdom of the Imam Hussein. And he said, uh, so we had all worked it out and a group of Baha'is went to the, immediately to the well and lowered a rope down and he said, I was the youth that went down first and we had to load the uh, the rocks into a basket and they were taken out until we, we came to the to this young man's body. Now this is probably six months after the martyrdom. And he said, when, we un when I uncovered the rocks from the body, he said, you know, I, would, I, I wasn't sure what, what we would encounter. Uh, the body, it was very dry there. The body had, was not uh, decomposed, but it was dried. And the fragrance of roses, he said, came out of it and overwhelmed him, the beauty of, of roses, and they took the body out and they buried it here, and you are standing at the grave there, which then I prostrated myself there, said praise for this, this, this young man. Such experiences that they had even in our, in our times. I saw Corinne True in the convention in the United States in 1958. Uh, Corinne True was the woman responsible, really, uh, with the instructions of the Master to build the house of worship in America. She was part of a committee, but she, he was, she was the liaison between Abdu'l Baha and the Temple, uh, Baha'i Temple Foundation group that got the uh, house of worship started. And she was quite elderly. She'd been uh, at the Guardian's request, she'd been to Cuba, she'd been in a wheelchair, she was sent around different places. Amazing lady. She was quite frail and they helped her to the, to the stage and she came to the platform and she looked out with this wonderful smile beaming on everybody and she said, Allah Abha. And now I think I'll sit down. <laughs> <laughs> she was the only hand that was not able to attend the first meetings of the hands of the cause or go to the guardian's funeral because of her frailty at that point. Martha Root was an amazing woman. She became the foremost, called the foremost hand of the cause, raised up by the hand of destiny in the time that we lived. And she proceeded with a level of faith which oftentimes didn't require physical means. They would come along the way oddly enough. At one time she arrived in San Francisco and she had, uh, I think she said she had 15 cents American. She'd come on a ship from Hawaii and she had no money. 
But she had, she was, uh, uh, it had been arranged for her to have a public meeting at the Baha'i Center in San Francisco on that evening. And so she'd come and she used that money on the streetcar to get to the, to the Baha'i meeting. And she says, well, I had to trust in Baha'u'llah after that, what would happen. And uh, at the meeting, uh, she gave this beautiful Baha'i talk and excited the audience and so on. By the way, she, would, she was one of these women who was quite simple. People who I met who'd seen her said she was a very, very plain woman, a very simple woman. But when she got on the platform and began talking about Baha'u'llah and his teachings, she changed into something else. And she would, because of her sterling character, her saintliness, her brilliant insight into the writings, she would stir the audience. So that night she stirred a society lady that was, had come to the meeting, had been invited to the meeting. She got so excited that she came to, to uh, Martha Ritt after the, after the talk was finished and she said, she said, please, I beg you, come home with me to my country estate and stay a couple of weeks and rest and recover after your trip and teach my family these wonderful teachings. I know you, but I, I, I don't want to interfere with you, but I think this is... So Martha Ruth said, yes, that's very kind of you. Thank you, I'll do, I'll do that. And that was what happened. And she didn't have to spend her nickel that was left. Then uh, she was in touch with, uh, with her newspaper in the East and they got more money wired to her. And, she went on with her activities. It was like that. And she usually had, and sometimes she had only one dress, and she would wash it at night and put it on in the morning again. And this is the lady that went and visited presidents and attracted Queen Marie of Romania to the faith to become a Baha'i. Marvelous. Uh, in the Holy Land, as I said, as it was mentioned, I. I, I saw all of the living hands except for Corinne True at the International Convention. They were there uh, to witness the election of the first Universal House of Justice. And then we went on, all of us went on to London here for the uh, International First Congress, World Congress of the Baha'is. And uh, various of these hands of the cause spoke to the friends who were present. And some of that's recorded. You can find out that yourself. The last, uh, Mr. Fortan, of course, was in the Holy Land for years. On the teaching center, we had Ryokonom, we had Mr. Fortan, Mr. Fazy, Mr. Haney, Paul Haney, and three counselors. So there were seven members, and gradually there were more counselor members added until finally the hands of the cause either passed away or came to the meetings of the teaching center only occasionally or when the teaching center was meeting with the Universal House of Justice. And uh, the last of the hands who was brought to the Holy Land was Ali Muhammad Varga. And uh, he, as the trustee of the Hukuk, he had his offices there. And he was able then to meet with the pilgrims regularly. And such a, such a dear man. And nobody thought he would be the last of the hands. We thought some of the younger ones would have lasted. But through various circumstances, we lost those. So. This is a heritage. The House of Justice wrote a tribute at that point, uh, which I wish I had a copy of, but you can also find that in my records and read it. The great self-abnegation and the terrific dedication of, the, of these hands of the cause of God to the service of mankind under the inspiration and of Baha'u'llah's teachings and under the direction of the beloved guardian and then through their own consultations. Uh, and finally through, um, if you will, orienting and encouraging the counselors who became then the main members of the body of the International Teaching Center as it's known today. Thank you very much. <laughs>